Well, welcome to a very special edition of Unbelievable. It's a first for this show in many ways. Uh, this is the first episode I can remember where I've actually recorded it from home. And why? Well, you know why. It's because of coronavirus. We're all working from home now, if we can. And today on the show, I'm very glad to be joined by AJ Roberts and Mark Sayers as we ask big questions about this coronavirus pandemic. How will it change the church and the world? world. Now, Anjanette Roberts, or AJ for short, is a research scholar with reasons to believe, and she has a background in virology research. Mark Says is a pastor out in Australia and increasingly well known as a theologian of church and culture. And he, of course, co-hosts the popular podcast, This Cultural Moment with John Mark Comer. And because I'm recording from home, I've one more very special guest joining me. Come here. This is my wife, Hello. Lucy Briley. <laughs> And uh, Lucy is the Reverend Lucy Riley because she is a minister of a church here in Surrey where we live. And so I brought Lucy on to sort of give an on the ground perspective uh, from someone who's a minister of a local church community and how we're kind of dealing with it uh, here uh, in our home turf. So um, AJ and Mark, welcome along to the show as well. Um, it's, it's so good to have you both. Obviously, AJ, you've been with us before at our conference in the USA. Uh, Mark, this is a first. Um, great to have you on. I've listened to you many times uh, with John Mark Comer on this cultural moment. So uh, I'll, I'll start with you, first of all, Mark. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what are things like at the moment, just where you are with the uh, coronavirus and, and all of that going on in your community? Yeah, so uh, yeah, pastor here in uh, Melbourne at Red Church. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been really fascinating um, just seeing this, particularly with Australia, we've just had a really terrible bushfire season. Mm. Um, and then sort of we've come from that into, into this. We have um, obviously quite a lot of trade and a large amount of Australian population is Chinese. So there's a lot of uh, movement between the two countries. Um, so just near here, uh, where I sort of grew up uh, about a a mile away is Box Hill, named after the Box Hill in Surrey. Um, and, oh, um, yeah. Yes, uh, a Surrey migrant, I uh, credit that. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, it's a very, very Chinese area and probably 90% mainland Chinese. So you sort of ha saw it happening early and there's almost two modes of recognition to what was going on where the Chinese population just went into lockdown and um, you know other Australians were wandering around a little bit unaware. But I think the gravity... Um, and the disruption is now becoming more and more apparent. I mean, we haven't hit the level of lockdowns that other places have. We're at 100 people gathering limits. Um, and we've sort of shut the borders as a country now, which is the first time that's happened in, you know, I've never seen that really before. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's how we're sort of, we are positioned at the moment. You, your church, I think, actually made the decision not to meet last weekend. Was that right? Yeah. So it was just a crazy, oh man, what a crazy, oh, the last week feels like a year. Um, yeah. So we had um, uh, initially, uh, you know, different recommendations and we were debating and I just felt this call to sort of, uh, the, the term I'm using is go hard, go early. Um, uh, I felt like we had to protect um, our vulnerable people. You know, I had a conversation with my dad, my, my mum and dad are in the seventies, they both have different health pro you know, problems. And I had this conversation um, and he just was like, you know, wrestling with, do they come? And I just thought, I can't put people in that risky position. Um, our church has got a lot of millennials, um, but we've also got millennials with health challenges as well. And, mm -hmm. and we just felt like we saw where this was going. And I think a lot of churches in Australia, uh, we, we had to take a sort of almost, you know, prophetic um, stance yeah. to go early. Um, so it was absolutely crazy. You know, we just went all Friday, all Saturday, and then we have, we have four services that we do. And we um, did one service on the live stream on um, Sunday morning, um, uh, which was amazing. Um, yeah. So super proud of my team. Want to give a shout out to them. They just worked like absolute Trojans. Yeah, brilliant. We, we kind of had our first experience. We're not like a massively technically proficient church, probably not in the way that you guys are, Mark. But, but we, we actually live streamed for the first time from our church on Sunday because so many people weren't going to be coming along and we kind of anticipated it, it might be the last Sunday we'd be able to have people in person anyway and indeed yeah. the, the advice did change soon after that from Boris Johnson and the government um it, it was I mean it, it was kind of obviously a, a difficult decision and, and we had to kind of get it all together quite quickly but it did work quite well in the end we felt it did we were we were sensing as the week went on that um fewer and fewer people would be attending um, and we thought, how, how can we include them? We felt like we were going to be half a community and we wanted mm. to have a sense of being a whole community. So we, um, 
with we, with about 24 hours notice we were like oh how can how can we do this how can we do this so facebook live easy um and we did some streaming on youtube we need to up our game for this week <laughs> um, we, we can't meet physically this week um you know that that happened very quickly over a few days this week um yeah so it's been as you say we've been relying on our staff um and so many people working behind the scenes just to just to make things possible and help people feel connected yeah. yeah so so that's that's kind of where where we're at at the moment what what's going on with you aj what's i mean you're obviously in california um how's the situation there at what stage of lockdown are you would you say at this point yeah so uh, as far as i understand the actual official situation is that uh just one uh the communities around san francisco which are northern california i'm in southern california uh have been asked to shelter in place and last I heard, which this certainly could have changed, uh, the New York City was also thinking of ordering sheltering in place. But right now it's, it's mostly just doing what you can do to self-isolate if you're sick. Uh, everybody over the age of 60 has been asked to work at home if they, if they can. Um, many of my friends work for universities that have basically said, as of this week, Monday, uh, many of them are working at home. Uh, I work as an adjunct professor for a university on the on the East Coast, and um, they also went to all online learning this week. So, so many places in the U.S. are, if we're going to use the terminology, self-isolating, remotely working. Um, it's it's higher and higher numbers depending upon the community. Uh, I have friends in Arizona, and they're kind of like, yeah, no, we're still going to restaurants and. You know, everybody, everybody's fine down here in Arizona. So, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a constantly changing situation. And like Mark said, you know, you feel like it just five days ago was already five months ago it, because you just it so does. It, it does. Uh, it, it, you, you really sense the way that each day brings some new restriction, some new policy, you know, new surprises. Um, we've, we've been on tenterhooks to hear what the latest briefing is going to be each mm -hmm. afternoon from Downing Street. Um, so, so it, there's almost a sense of it, it, it feeling a bit like you're, you're on some kind of a war footing or something. It's, it does have that kind of a urgent national crisis kind of feel to it. And, and obviously that's one being shared by literally almost everyone around the world at this point. So it's, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. I mean, worth saying at this point, AJ, and I'm going to come to you for some of the science now. Um, we are recording this on Wednesday night here in the UK. Um, so this situation may change. This is just the, the, the facts as we have them at this point. But um, just, I mean, a really basic question to start with from you, AJ, which is, uh, what is the coronavirus? Because I think many people think they know what it is, but what is it? How does it actually affect the body? And, and what do you think of, you know, the strategy that's being employed both here in the UK and elsewhere for basically people to isolate in order to try and stop the, the spread of the virus? Right. So um, the coronavirus, when we refer to it that way, um, is, is basically referring to a broad category or a family of viruses. And, and so coronaviruses uh, as a whole are different than other families of viruses. So although there are some similarities with initial symptoms with the flu, uh, influenza is in a different family of viruses. And that means that the viruses sort of on a structural level, a genetic level, they're very different from one another. Their genomes are different. Uh, perhaps they share other commonalities like the way that they're transmitted. So influenza can be transmitted by droplets or those droplets can land on hard surfaces. And based on the biology of influenza, those particles on hard surfaces can remain infectious for a certain amount of time. Uh, the same is true for coronaviruses. And I don't, maybe we should agree how we wanna to refer to this particular virus uh, it's called SARS-2 because of its similarity to the original coronavirus outbreak that had a 10% mortality that didn't spread very far, but it, it, it was scary back when that was happening in 2003. Um, and, and you were and so actually were, involved in the research on that, that one back in 2003, weren't you? I absolutely was. I, I joined the NIH specifically to work on uh, the SARS research that was going on in 2003. And I worked from the, at the NIH from 2003 to 2006 on SARS. Uh, and what makes this one, on the one hand, less deadly, thankfully, but actually more contagious, it, it appears? Yes, it, it does appear to be more contagious. Uh, 
because of the rate at which it's spreading across the globe. Uh, but there are other factors that are affecting that. So it may not actually have a higher transmission rate. It just can be transmitted for longer and by people who don't have symptoms. And the incubation period may be a little bit longer than the original SARS. So uh, what, what makes it different? Is that what you asked? Yeah. So, so why, why, why does this, obviously we know that it primarily is a danger to those over a certain age and with underlying health conditions and so on. Um, what, but, but the mortality rate, as I understand it, as you say, rel relatively low compared to yes. other forms of the coronavirus. So, so what's, what, what makes that a difference? So, yeah, so again, there are a variety of coronaviruses and, and certainly as a human population, we've had a couple of coronaviruses that are associated with the common cold that have been circulating with the human population for a very long time. Uh, we've, we've known about these viruses when they were first isolated back in the 1950s and 1960s. And so coronaviruses before the original SARS in 2002, 2003, was, was thought of as not a human pathogen that was of great international or national concern because it just caused a cold. Um, but when SARS emerged, they started to look for other coronaviruses because we were very shocked to find out that what was killing people at that point in time wasn't flu. We thought it was probably flu and it wasn't, it was SARS, a coronavirus. And so we started looking for other ones and we found a couple of other ones that are also circulating in the human population but they're associated with upper respiratory infections. So not as severe as SARS. Um, SARS, the original, SARS, the current, SARS-2, and then one in between uh, from dromedary camels was introduced into the human population in the Middle East. And that's referred to as MERS because it's Middle Eastern. But all three of these, along with some of the influenzas that we're worried about may eventually be pandemics as well. Those are referred to as H5N1, H7N9, that's just referring to a couple of different proteins in the influenza virus, but they're, they're designating different strains that the human population, like now to SARS-2, is broadly naive. Those viruses haven't been circulating in the human population. And so that means we're very susceptible to infections. And so the transmission rate may be very high for this virus. It, or it may be comparable to flu, and, and just because it's a naive population, it's, it's spreading more quickly yeah. and more broadly. And we're able to trace it, right? We're able to trace it as we do tests. And, and obviously that testing is going on all the time and we're, we're learning as we go, but we're still at a very early stage, I suppose, in knowing how to deal with it. And, and, and I guess most governments are just kind of going with what they know as of now it appears to be the best practice for trying to reduce the spread of the transmission. And we've heard a lot about flattening the curve and, and so on to try and ensure that the health services in countries don't get overwhelmed so that although we may see the same kind of number of people ultimately infected, that at least it won't be happening over a very short period. Um, and, and honestly, Justin, that's one of the most important points I think we ought to try and bring out as far as the epidemiology and the certain, uh, the, the current situation of the pandemic globally. Uh, we want to slow the rate of spread. Uh, some people would argue that we don't even actually want to stop the spread. We kind of want to let it take its course through the human population, but at a slowed controlled rate as much as we can, so that we as a global community can develop sort of mm. a baseline immunity to this, so that we don't have outbreaks occurring over and over and over again oh. with the same type of local effects. I, I mean, I've heard that, that this really is references to what's sometimes called herd immunity, um, uh, which seems to be a kind of uh, a characteristic of a population broadly starting to develop immunity naturally to, to, to these kinds of things. Is the hope that if enough people develop it within a population, you won't see it simply repeating and repeating? Yes, uh, that's that's one of the ultimate outcomes if we can get herd immunity, either at a you know national or community or global level. But um, you know, there are, what you really want to do is you want to be able to have immunity within a population, so that the the spread from person to person is disrupted. Sure. Uh, so you know, if if I'm immune, I can become immune a couple of different ways through a natural course of infection, or through a successful vac vaccination or immunization re regime. But we don't have a vaccine yet. Uh, I mean, we're hopeful. There's probably 
15 different potential vaccines in the pipeline right now, globally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, but those probably won't be available uh, for a year and a half or so. Uh, maybe a little bit faster, but probably yeah. not much faster because we don't want to circumvent safety issues. So, well, well let, let, let me come to you at this point, Mark, because obviously one of the big things that has been you know, talked about a great deal here in the UK, and I'm sure in Australia as well, is social distancing and all those rules about washing your hands and taking precautions and everything else to try and stop, you know, interrupt the transmission of this virus from person to person and to flatten that curve, as it were. Um, what I mean, do, to what extent do you find that being taken seriously at the moment where you are? Because I, we've certainly had some pretty stringent advice given, but we it's currently not being enforced at, you know, legal sort of in any martial way here in the UK. But you do see what's happened in Italy and we're being told, well, we're only a few weeks behind that and so on. So I, I, I'd be interested to know what, what it feels like at the moment in Australia, whether you feel people are taking this seriously and whether, you know, we may end up actually in, you know, if we don't take it seriously in a similar situation to, to other countries where they've obviously been badly hit by it. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, this is a stress test on various systems of our culture, um, economically, politically, um, on health systems. And in some ways, this is a stress test on some of our cultural responses. And I think I referred to it before. It's just been so fascinating, the different cultural responses in our, in our different Australian groups here. I think um, many Chinese people who have a, a cultural memory of SARS a few years ago, many who were in Beijing and Hong Kong who lived through that, they saw this coming early. They were in masks. They were almost sheltering in place uh, very early on. Um, there's a lot of Chinese population at my children's school. Our schools are still open at the moment. They're hoping to get some of that herd immunity. Um, but what's happening is um, a number of the uh, Chinese students are just staying away. Um, so my uh, son had half his class was there uh, yesterday. And uh, I was in Malaysia uh, five weeks ago and saw, you know, like going to like uh, tourist spots. I went up the Petronas Towers and was having my temperature tested. And uh, being in Asia, I just saw how people would take it a lot more seriously. Um, so what I'm seeing here is you've got that different response in different uh, cultural groups and um, other Australians, are, you know, I was walking home from the office yesterday and hearing this, you know, older couple talking at the front like, oh, this is all just, you know, it's a bit of a hoax, isn't it? Um, you know, like, oh, it's just media mayhem and panic and, um, you know, I'm just going to go out if I want to. So in some senses, I think the stress test being placed is on Western individualism in contrast to perhaps more Asian communal thinking. Um, but I think that's going to start to get pushed back as some of the implications of this, um, I think, become more apparent. And, you, you know, uh, I mean, in some ways, Italy, I've heard, has had, you know, some of it's about their healthcare response, but also Italians are very sociable. Um, you know, lots of kissing and hugging. I was talking to my Italian Australian friend at church. He's like, oh, this is killing us as Italians. We can't hug everyone and talk to everyone. So, um, yeah, I, but I think all of that's going to become more and more apparent. And I think our behavior will adapt. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the big things that's going to hit is as we try to live out this kind of social, you know, social distancing and, and trying to keep away from people. And obviously, for some people, that's even more critical than others, the, the 70 plus population and so on. But that, that's going to take a huge different kind of toll, obviously, in terms of relationally. Now, Luce, we have you know, a number of older people in our church and I can we're anticipating this is going to hit them especially hard because they may not even be as socially connected on the social media and the WhatsApps and all that kind of thing. And they actually do depend to a great deal on those regular engagements, the lunch clubs, the, the getting together with people in social ways. I think this is the thing that's probably broken my heart the most in the last few weeks, actually, is um, I, I was talking to a woman a few weeks ago. She'd been ill, nothing to do with this, but she'd been ill. She'd missed church for two weeks and she came back and she took my hands and she said, my dear, I just don't know how I managed to be away from you all. This is, this is, this is my family. This is my home. And, mm -hmm. and now, of course, none of us can see her um, and countless other people in our, in our family, our church family. We, we can't see them. Um, and it's just so kind of counter instinctive, isn't it? That I'm busy sending out mailings and letters and WhatsApp posts and, and all sorts of things telling people we've shut the church. Mm. I mean, that's it's kind of just goes against every instinct within me you know i spent my whole life encouraging people into into relationship through the church family 
and then suddenly we're saying that that has to look really different from now on mm. um, for this for this season. And, and I'd really like to I'd really like to comment on that. Go it's going to look really different, uh, and also throw in the comment that yes, the elderly in our church are are certainly in a higher vulnerability, a l larger risk category than than the younger uh, millennials or or even the people on this show, uh, but. Uh, my mother, uh, who's actually in a full-skilled nursing facility in a different state, uh, that, that nursing facility has just been put on lockdown. Uh, it's been on lockdown for the past week, which means basically no one can come visit mm -hmm. uh, and only health professionals who work there can have contact with the residents so that we avoid something that's happened in other facilities where you have close proximity of a very vulnerable population, right? So... Uh, but but the facility there has now implemented uh, FaceTime sessions. And so my mother and I can actually communicate by FaceTime. I just let them know which times I'd like to be available. And my mom can actually see me now instead of just hear me on the phone. Uh, and, and so that was a, a huge boost to her. And so as a single individual in my church community, I've got to tell you, I look forward to that church fellowship as much as the elderly population who, who lives alone as well. But the, the singles also, you know, I think we need to be really careful not to adopt either one of the extremes that Mark was referencing, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna panic. We don't wanna add to the hysteria. We don't wanna make this any worse than it is. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to pretend like it's all just a hoax and there is no real risk. Um, so- Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I have, bumped into some people. Unfortunately, these kinds of scenarios inevitably bring out the hoaxes and the, the fake news online, you know, and I've seen people sharing supposed remedies and things like that, which are, which are clearly false and, and shouldn't be. But, but this, I suppose, in a way is, is where we hope at least the church can step up and be a voice, both of hope and reason and, um, and, and give people, you know, good advice, but also ways to be in touch with each other and, and have a good community. I mean, Luce, we're, we're trying in our situation to make sure that people are both obviously being communicated to with all the technology we have at our fingertips, but also for those who may not be in that situation, uh, simply people get, get on the phone and talk to people and that kind of thing. Yeah, we, um, we've identified everyone in our, in our church family who we, we know isn't online in any way. Um, oh. We do still have people like that. And, um, so, you know, we printed out all of the information that we've been posting and sending uh, online. We, we printed it out and we put it in envelopes and a team of people went around and put it through doors today. And there was yeah. one lovely moment, speaking about care homes, um, one lovely moment where I dropped something, I had to just poke it through the door of the care home and the member of staff received it from me. But the lady I was delivering it happened to walk by with her Zimmer frame, just as I did it. And I could just wave to her and say, hi, hi, Molly, um, this letter's for you. It's from your nice. church family. And, and we just exchanged yeah. a moment across this you know, glass divide, which was really actually quite profound and, and special. And we have to reach out. We have to you know, find, find ways. You know, I, I, I was just listening to you talk. Uh, I was sitting here thinking, you know, many of us, if we're actually getting, getting to the point where, where we're sort of sheltering at home, even if that's not the official call, but that's sort of we're limiting our actions that way. Those of us that live in families probably have more, more than one mobile device, right? We probably have more than one way to communicate online. And so maybe that's something that our churches could do would be sort of a redistribution of those devices to people who are isolated without the ability to communicate this way, video uh, connection. And so, you yeah. know, there's lots of ways we can start to be creative. Necessity yeah. is the mother of invention, <laughs> right? Uh, well, it, it is. Often it's these circumstances that force you. And in a way, I can foresee, Mark, a lot of churches that maybe have been slow on the uptake with technology kind of being forced to actually now actually experiment and see what they can do to keep in touch with their community and indeed, you know, to, to be salt and light in, in, in the wider community as well. So what, what do you see happening? What are you seeing happening at your end with churches around you? Are you seeing a kind of a creative response to this or is there kind of, you know, is this going to be a big learning curve for a lot of churches, do you think, to exist in this new kind of environment for a while? Yeah, I mean, I think the indicator for me was, I think, yeah, about last Thursday or Friday, as different areas of the world went locked down, my phone just started exploding <laughs> with pastors all over the world. And just like, how do we respond? And 
um, you know, I found it, there's just something profound that's happening in this. And, um, you know, it's, it's a profound fundamental change for how the church is going to operate in the next little period. Um, it was interesting when we first decided to go to live stream, you know, I was thinking, you know, how do we do this? You know, we don't normally do that. We almost had a value that we don't want to do that because we, uh, you know, we want to still have that presence and, and, you know, we tend to grow services rather than just going uh, live despite, you know, a podcast uh, people listen to and so on. But, um, you know, I realized very quickly, uh, like I'm thinking, what's it going to look like? How, what's, what's the, how, how can we pull something together that looks great in two days, you know? And I think we did well. Um, but what I noticed is this incredible leveling at the moment. So, you know, I'm seeing mega church pastors in America with huge resources and all of a sudden they're looking like we are here. They're just on a, on a webcam, you know? And I, 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 so there was interesting things. So I saw this mega church pastor on a webcam and then my mate um, who's, who does a house church. And I thought they look exactly the same. And yeah. so what I noticed is that I think at a moment like this leadership changes as well, that some of the, oh, I don't want to, you know, I guess how we're talking is changing. Some of the messages, which almost yesterday would people would listen to almost seem trite now. So with this great leveling, people are looking for spiritual authority, people actually speaking into the situation uh, who are guiding people through it with gravity, but also hope. So I think that communication changes um, and what I'm seeing it is, is in a sense, there's three layers of church. There's this layer where we communicate as leaders from the top. Often that's done through preaching or in person, bulletins, all these different things. Then you have the congregation, which is sort of that mediating group of people. And then you have individuals or small groups. That entire middle part has been taken out for the next period. So there's a sense where, you know, my first sermon, I just said, I'm commissioning you guys, you know, like this has been forced on me. You know, I already had leaders and volunteers, but I just said, I'm commissioning you guys. And look, the good news story for me, again, at a church with a lot of millennials, I think we've been at this moment where millennials have been very derided. Um, I, I think this is a moment where it could be the making of so many young adults. You know, I've seen young adults, we're just getting texts of young adults who are putting flyers in the letterboxes of neighbors saying, Hey, I'm here. I'm healthy. I can bring you eggs. I can bring you milk. Mm. I can go and get stuff for you. Um, others who are setting up stuff for healthcare workers who are going to be in the front line now. Um, there was this moment when we did the first live stream and we prayed and I got my tech guys and there was just a, a handful of us in there. And I think, I think we were all praying and man, I get emotional. I That's get right. emotional. I'm tired, a bit tired. But I remember there's this moment where I saw in them, something click into like, this is real. Yeah. And, and there was this moment where we finished the rehearsal and I said, we prayed, finished the rehearsal. And I said, the rehearsal's over. And there's just, I think the Holy Spirit. And, and then I just said, and maybe not just for the live stream. Mm. And it was almost like I could see my team of millennials just got it. And, yeah. and they were like, okay, this is our moment. Mm. And there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, before this, this intergenerational media driven rubbish of like, you know, okay, boomer and boomers versus millennials. And, you know, there's that whole meme, okay, boomer, like whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I saw someone on Twitter write, you know, dead, okay, boomer, alive, are you okay, boomer? And yeah. so I just think that in the midst of this, you know, gods can do some incredible things of knitting our communities back together when they seem like they're being physically torn apart. Yeah. I. We're going to take a quick break, um, but I want to come back to talking about the church and, and the bigger global issues as well going on and and some of the opportunities it represents as well as the challenges. Because I think I think for me, this is a point at which it gets real. Like you say, you know, rehearsal's over. This is when the rubber hits the, gra the road and you find out if the church can do what it was mandated to do by God and um, and do it in quite different circumstances to maybe what we anticipated. So um We'll be back in a short moment's time. You're listening to special edition of Unbelievable. Looking at the coronavirus pandemic, uh, I'm Justin Briley, joined spectacularly for the first time by my wife, Lucy, uh, because we're doing this from home. This is a homemade version of Unbelievable today. AJ Roberts and Mark Sayers are also my guests on today's show. We'll be back very shortly. What I want to invite Roger <laughs> to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness it's too much like us <laughs> it's it's too Maybe much like, like putting it <laughs> like yes like the greek views of the gods in some sense they were like but too much like but us. they were finite <laughs> and contingent here we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source i admire this 
noble aspiration to find the highest possible ideal. It's almost as if you're proposing a new religion to meet this new challenge. It's not a new religion. Yes. What it is is something that sits in the same place. Mm. It addresses some of the same needs, but it is not founded on the same principle. If the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this? Or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved? Welcome back to this special edition of Unbelievable Today. Uh, for the first time, coming from the Briley household, because we are, well, we're not exactly on lockdown here in the UK, but we are under stringent advice to try and be uh, socially distant. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to not ever talk to people. We've got modern technology, but it does mean you can't be physically too close to people uh, if possible. I am working from home. Uh, we have had to shut the church building, not the yeah. church itself, because the church is, of course, is, is more than the building. Uh, my wife, Lucy Briley, uh, is with me. She's the minister of our church here in Surrey. Uh, joined as well uh, on the line, this is a very international edition of the show, by AJ Roberts out in California from Reasons to Believe. Yeah. She's a virologist by background. And Mark Sayers out in Australia is a pastor there and a bit of a specialist on church and culture. And um, I, I, I mean, I would say this is the week where it started to feel really real, AJ, here in the UK. Uh, at the beginning of the week, we had sort of the advice from the government, strong advice for anyone who can work from home, work from home, um, basically saying, do not, do not do social gatherings of any kind, um, pubs, clubs, theatres, Basically, the West End is shut down. Uh, it's got huge implications for lots of small businesses and so on. Then uh, the day after, there was a big economic package re revealed um, because of those economic concerns. Then just today, as I say, recording on Wednesday, they announced that the schools are all going to be shut from next week. Um, so we, we just keep seeing these measures come on and on. And who knows what the next might be, whether it's going to be some kind of martial enforcement of some of these issues and so on, if, if it's not felt that the population is, is doing it well enough. Mm. And yet at the same time, I, I still hear people saying, oh, it's a lot of fuss about nothing. Or, yeah. um, you know, is it really any worse than, you know, the kind of mortality that flu induces from year to year and so on? So what, what would you say to the person who's still kind of saying, look, let's, you know, this isn't as serious as everyone claims it to be, AJ. Yeah, so uh, actually, I, I get these kinds of questions on my social media pages. Uh, and and it's, it's very different even then, I'm going to compare it to the 2009 influenza epidemic, which was also declared probably somewhat incorrectly as a pandemic by the WHO. But uh, that's been one of the most severe influenza seasons we've faced in, in most of our lifetimes. Uh, and it was the introduction of a type of flu called H1N1. And uh, then it, we had some of the highest mortality rates that we've had uh, because of the epidemic nature. But the surprising thing was that many of the most vulnerable population for flu and for SARS, the current coronavirus, are the elderly. Uh, for flu, it's also the very, very young, which is different than this current virus. The very young aren't a high risk category with SARS right now. But uh, those populations uh, for the 2009 outbreak, actually the elderly were protected and they didn't have severe disease. And it's because they had some pre-existing immunity because the 1918 influenza epidemic, which killed tens of millions of people worldwide uh, was very serious, but it was also an H1N1 type flu. And so that type of virus circulated in the human population up until the early 1950s. And so anybody that was born prior to the 1950s in 2009 had pre-existing immunity. Okay. And so although that could have been a pandemic that looked a lot more like what this is going to look like by the time it's finished, um, it didn't because we had some pre-existing immunity. There is no pre-existing immunity in the population right now. So mm -hmm. to compare what we're experiencing now to even a flu epidemic or pandemic or the seasonal flu 
which has a fatality rate estimated, and I have to emph emphasize estimated because we don't track the number of flu cases annually. Um, it's estimated that that fatality rate is 0.1%, which is not very high. Uh, and yet, we've had in the US alone this year over 22,000 deaths associated with the flu. And this is a, a pretty bad flu season for us. It's mm -hmm. not epidemic level. It's just under the threshold of epidemic level. But that's across the board. It's killing younger people more than the 2009 uh, virus did. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a big number. Well, if we take that same estimated fatality rate and we superimpose the numbers that we have globally uh, with the current coronavirus, we're looking at numbers that could be 30 to 40 to 60 times higher or even higher than that. And so another comparison of the numbers, at the peak of the flu season this year, we had in the US about 400 deaths per week from flu. If we were to do, take, take those same sort of, let's say a 3% global mortality rate, although the number actually just went over 4% globally today, that may or may not be accurate because we may be still grossly under detecting cases. Mm -hmm. but, but if it's 4% or 3%, you're now talking about a number that's 30 to 40 times higher than that 400 per week. Mm -hmm. And so now you're talking about 12,000 deaths per week mm -hmm. if it were to reach that flu, yeah. that flu level. Yeah. We're in a naive population. And if we don't take these kinds of actions where we try to limit the spread, and protect the most vulnerable. So, you know, God bless Mark's congregation who are mostly millennials who are out there saying, I'm not at huge risk, let me sort of step up, fill in the gap. That's perfect because they're at very low risk. Uh, under 50, it's less than 1%, uh, less than half a percent mm. uh, case fatality. Uh, over the age of 80, it's up around 15 to 16% case fatality. Uh, it's actually higher if you have comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Um, surprisingly, respiratory issues aren't on that list of comorbidities. So I'm kind of like, whew, you know, I, I have asthma and it's like, well, it doesn't put me in a higher risk category, at least not, not apparently so. So if, if we look at the numbers that way, this current pandemic is rightly described as a pandemic because there is sustained human to human transmission in multiple communities across the globe. Uh, and if you actually look at some of the, the epidemiological curves for the global situation, China's sort of plateaued off, but, and everybody's going for sort of the Chinese model, right? Can we get to that plateau? Can we flatten the curve so mm -hmm. that our health system can keep up with the, with the really bad cases? Uh, that's what we're trying to achieve. And that's what we want to see. Uh, but if we don't, what we're going to see is what's now happening to all the other places besides China right now. That epidemiological curve is on a very steep climb, mm. and it's much steeper than the Chinese climb was. Yeah. And, so, and so we need to really take this seriously. Whether we think we're personally at risk or not, we need to be, especially as Christians, we need to be loving our neighbors and taking precautions to help protect the vulnerable. So yeah. I could I could go into more numbers if you're interested. Please <laughs> ask, but I don't want to I don't want to sort of over the top with numbers. So well, well I I was going to say I I think the the problem sometimes is is that when you're not seeing it face to face, people kind of don't somehow don't think it's quite there. But as I say, that was probably the way people in Italy felt, you know, a month ago or whatever. Yeah. And, and it only takes a few weeks for the situation to change very rapidly and people to realize. It, it really yeah. does. And I think there's one other number that I really need to do as a head-to-head -head comparison. So for flu, the, so when we talk about herd immunity, one of the things that we try to accomplish is, is to, we would love to see about 70% of the population be immune to this because that would probably keep us away from those steep climbs. But when we talk about herd immunity, we also talk about what's called a, a replication factor. And that means how many people, if I have the coronavirus, how many people am I likely to infect? Well, there's a lot of factors that can come into play to that. Number one is how long do I have the disease? 
how high is my virus replication numbers inside my body, how much of that am I shedding into the community, and how many people do I come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis while I'm infectious. And because I won't, I or someone may not be symptomatic, we don't necessarily know how long that period may be. Mm. And so anyway, all of those factors sort of going together into a giant complex estimation for this particular coronavirus, that transmission, that R0, that replication rate is that it's estimated that if I'm infected, I can infect up to two and a half to three other people but there are already super spreaders, people who can affect far more than that on record for this outbreak. In China, one person infected 13 different healthcare workers. So that would have been an R0 or a replication factor of 13 for that one individual. In Boston, Massachusetts, uh, there's a pharma company there that had a meeting of top executives and the numbers that I saw for there was they're not sure if it was one individual that was infected at that meeting or more than one individual, but 77 people ended up coming down with uh, coronavirus COVID from having attended that meeting. And so there's another case of a documented super spreader. And so anyway, we compare that number, that estimate, two and a half to three people, typical person infected with this coronavirus is going to spread it to that many people. For flu, that number is 1.6 to 2. And so it's a much lower transmission number. Part of that could be because there is sort of a base immunity, but also there is a massive vaccination campaign every year mm -hmm. to vaccinate people from flu, right? And so that number is still pretty high for flu. That number may still be very high much higher than two and a half to three for SARS for coronavirus, but we just don't know that number definitively yet. Those are estimates. So yeah. it's a very serious situation. Yeah, absolutely. And and a reminder, I suppose, that Mark, sadly, there have been stories that, of churches who have, um, rather than being helpful, being quite harmful. I mean, the, I, I remember that the, in South Korea, the church, which some say is more of a cult than a church, but, but where they seem to be very irresponsible in the way they they dealt with it and and that's really sad isn't it when when the church is actually not helping but harming yeah and and i think like if if i can sort of put the pastor's trans translation on what aj was just saying and, and i guess emphasize the importance of what aj was just saying um yeah we have uh, yeah that what many people call a cult in south korea is a super spreading event uh, I think in New York State at a synagogue, there was a spreading event. Uh, it looks like in the religious city in Iran, there was a spreading event at a religious event. Uh, in Malaysia, it looks like there's a super spreading event at a, at a mosque there. Um, and religious gatherings have the huge potential to be super spreading events. All you need is one person who's a super spreader who may be asymptomatic um, to go in there and your church is hugely contributing to the problem. And I think this, is, this needs to be heard. And I've, I've watched videos on, online of almost bullish pastors like, come, we're going to come anyway. You know, like, like, and I believe God can heal. And I can believe God, I'm praying that God stops this thing. But at the same time, I also want to protect my people. So I just really want to emphasize that. Think about what if you getting together in a, in a number that is large. And a lot of people are like, oh, my government said it's 100, so we're gonna be 99. I'm hearing this talk, like, and, and that's why we just went hard and went early. Just, just yeah. protect, you, you have a, a biblical injunction to protect the weak and vulnerable. And just because you can't see a virus does not mean it is not among you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was thinking of, of as well, this is not just necessarily as, as tragic as it will be, the issue of the mortality rate that, that we will eventually see from this but it's it's the knock-on effects as well isn't it i mean this has huge economic implications potentially we're looking at a recession in parts of the world an economic downturn because of this massive um spending that will have to be injected just to keep economies afloat and so on well in terms of the big picture and in terms of kind of where we got up to you know uh, because there are already some pretty serious issues going on around the world before coronavirus joined them. Um, what, what, where do you see the future for this? I'm kind of asking for your kind of imaginative prediction here in some way, Mark, but what, what do you think this is going to do to the culture more than just being a, a really big pandemic in you know, the first part of 2020? I mean, this could honestly be a 14 part <laughs> podcast series. My mind's exploding with all the implications. Um, 
I think, I think to put it this way, we, we um, as a global community, since really 1989, since the fall of the Soviet Union, have built an a, a international network, and that's connected digitally, but it's also connected through supply chains, uh, through international travel. Since 2009, since SARS-1, the international travel around the world has significantly increased. I think the number's by 25%. Uh, you know, up to, you know, I, I, you know, as someone, I live most of my time in my community, but then I do travel. I'm in the UK. I can use my uh, Uber account in the UK or in LA. There's this world which we're used to just moving around and everything's very simple. Um, that is being profoundly disrupted by this. Um, you know, I saw one person I've been following on Twitter who looks at international systems um, and he has been right on this. I've been following him on Twitter for some time. And just as this is developing, I mean, he just tweeted just before I got, he said, get ready to possibly say goodbye to international travel for one to three years. Wow. Yeah. People have not got their heads around that. Another yeah. possible implication is just say, uh, you know, Taiwan um, is I think doing pretty good and, and Hong Kong and Singapore, these places. What if New Zealand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, they're like, we're okay. We've got to handle it. So we're actually going to start flying between each other. But then Western Europe's just a red zone that we're going to stay away from. Um, if you look at the outbreaks as well, the outbreaks have flowed out of the international hubs. You know, we had it in central China, which is, you know, there's manufacturing. It's become the center of the world supply chain. Look where it's gone in the United States. It's gone in, you know, New York, San Francisco. These are hub cities. Um, so it is undoing the international political, global, social, and economic order. We are facing an economic issue, which is hugely unique before this happened of stagnating economies. Um, in the 1970s, um, before the political you know, revolutions in the United States of uh, Reaganism and in the UK of Thatcherism, that were in response to an economic problem of stagflation. We now have an economic problem of stagnation, but now we have dropping demand. So normally what you can do is you can stimulate by giving lots of people money, but what happens when no one's flying and no one's going to fly? What happens when no one's going to go to the cafe? What happens when no one's going to go to the restaurant? What happens when no one's going to go to a gym? So it's not the problem is that we just give more money and that stuff's going to come back online. People are just not going to do that for a significant yeah. period. So there is a huge uh, adjustment. You know, I think we're going to see you know, more and more people shop online, whereas past they might have been like... Um, you know, not wanting to do that almost, I'm like that a little bit, you know, I prefer yeah. to go to the local bookstore than that. But we're going to see a transformation of the economy and, and I think even the political sphere. It, we've become, the US election went from a 20-issue election to a one-issue election now, healthcare and preventing the coronavirus. Oh. Oh. AJ, did you want to come in on that? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's significant. I, I'm certainly seeing the same. I was attending, um, you know, some restaurants uh, earlier this past week, and I went into one place that's a very popular hamburger joint that's always wall-to-wall -wall people inside, and the drive drive through is usually backed up too, and uh, the drive through was twice as long as normal, and inside was a ghost town, right. and, uh, and so, you know, those places that, that don't have the ability to sort of distant service, uh, their clientele. Uh, but yeah, those those shutdowns are happening here. I mean, obviously, the ripple effect in the US economy has already been huge. I saw similar estimates that um, the the rate of infections could sort of simmer uh, for the at least a one to three year period. Um, and that's not necessarily bad. But it's if it affects the economy this way, for a sustained length of time, yeah. if we don't sort of find a a way to come back to a new normal. I think I think Mark's uh, perception and insight is is pretty spot on. I just want to come back to the admonition that he gave to pastors and the Christian responsibility to take this seriously, especially especially in regard to large group gatherings. Uh, if we go back to the South Korea uh, events, uh, we're talking about just Mar March 13th, not even a week ago. Well, a little over a week ago by the time this airs, but. At that point, South Korea had 8,000 reported cases, and today they have 13,000 reported cases. And of those 8,000 reported cases a little over a week ago, 60% of them were traceable back to that one religious community. And so, wow. so those numbers are very significant. Uh, you know, the, the warning can't be more sobering than, than just don't do it. And especially 
those that greet one another with kisses, you know, on both sides of your face or that share a common communion cup because SARS can persist in low alcohol solutions. It can persist on in saliva. It can persist on hard objects, solid surfaces, porous surfaces for hours, if not for days. And, uh, and so this is, you know, this is something to be taken very seriously. I mean, I, I think we're kind of at the very early stages here in the UK of, of seeing a, what this outbreak will look like once it really hits, you know, and people, and a lot of people start going down with this, but then it's almost hard to imagine, you know, given what Mark has just said, what the long-term implications might be and what kind of pastoral work we'll be doing in, in a kind of different environment where, so many businesses are potentially going to go out of business. I mean, high street shops were struggling to start with in the light of on the online, you know, competition, and everything. This, this will easily send most of them over the edge. And even the, you know, the government stimulus that is planned, it's hard to see how that's ultimately going to, you know, necessarily turn things around. So I can imagine that this isn't just going to be a health crisis and a, a pastoral response to that, Lucy, but in a way, there's going to be all kinds of other implications for, for how we're responding. I think, I, I think the needs are going to be countless. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that we're, we're already really conscious of, and I'm sure you are too, is, is people's mental health and, and what's going on for them there in all sorts of ways. I mean, not just because of isolation, but because of, of fear and anxiety and, and all sorts of, of issues. And so much of what we do as a church or what we have done up till now is, is about, is communal. It's, it's the coming together. We really promote that a, a huge amount. We, we spend our time inviting people into things to, to join together in groups. We did a whole teaching series earlier this year on feasting and, you know, biblical meal times and sharing food together and, and what that means and what that symbolizes, you know, and the feast of heaven and so on. And, and suddenly we're saying, well, actually, we, we really can't eat together. Um, and something that's really fundamental for, for, for us as Christians, you know, breaking bread, sharing wine, doing what Jesus asked us to do. And, and, and hey, suddenly we, we can't do it. We can't do it. And I'm already thinking, about, you know, when we, when we live stream our services, which we will from this Sunday, and it will be just be Justin and I and a couple of techies, um, you know, ministering to people. How can what does communion look like? How can we how can we share that? And I'm, I'm already mm. been trying to think of creative ideas about, you know, get yourself some bread, folks, and let's pray for it together online. And uh, and let's remember Jesus. We have to find these these creative ways to to build fellowship and and community. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to suggest that maybe we could move to to small group base, right? Because it's the real risk to the community are the large gatherings, right? Because then you can't, if you can imagine each one of us coming to a large gathering, we all get exposed at that large gathering. And then I go out and have another large gathering with a hundred different people, right? So it's, it's that sort of number of contacts of potentially infected individuals that needs to be minimized. And so I don't think it means that we need to just hang out with the people who are in our own home dwelling. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I went over to friends for dinner last night and, and it's like, but I trust them. They trust me. We both, you know, none of us are going to show up and, and, and hang out together if we're not feeling well, which, you know, okay, we could be asymptomatic. Let's take that into consideration. But I, I just think that over, overdoing, especially for long periods of time, the sort of like as isolated as some of us are implementing right now, that's going to become very, very bad for us as, as mm. individuals within a community. We're, mm. That just not, is just not a healthy way to live. And so we have to balance our activities in light of risk to the community. We have to balance our activities in light of risk to the most vulnerable. Uh, but I don't think that that means that we should avoid all potential risk because honestly i've got to tell you with this coronavirus we can't do that um mm. you know if we just compare what we had to do to contain the virus when we were working on it in the lab and what what you can do once a virus is out in the community those are two very different scenarios so infection will continue to happen in the environment that's not a bad thing, but we want to keep those numbers low and we want to protect the most vulnerable. But that doesn't mean we cut everybody off from physical 
physical contact with people outside our families. Yeah, it, it's it's a guess. It's a case of of sensibly making the right choices on that. And Mark, I mean, from from your perspective. Do you, what can the church do at this point? Um, because I think, as we said earlier, there, there's a sense in which the church has been so used to gathering and often in times of crisis, the natural reaction is to gather. To but gather. We're, yeah. we're saying now, no, actually, that's not what we need to be doing at this point, mm. in, at least in large numbers and so on. Um, what, what, what do you think churches can do practically at this point to be then good news, both to their own church family community, but also to, to the wider community? I mean, we, we I very quickly, when I realized where this was going, wrote down a sort of four, you know, word strategy on a bit of paper and, and for our church. And, um, you know, I'm happy to share this with others, you know, and the okay. first one was adapt, adapt, but you have to adapt your thinking. You have to adapt to the new reality. Everything has changed. And even when this, this pandemic settled down, one of the cultural and social lessons of the 1918 pandemic, it changed the, the culture of the world. Um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the, the NHS, uh, one of the like, growth of that was a response to what, they, you know, this is going to change the culture. It's going to change ministry. So you've got to adapt and you've got to adapt quickly and live in an adaptive, responsive mindset. The second thing we then put is we want to protect. You need to do the things as a church that are going to protect people. Um, AJ mentioned something there, which I think was really important around trust. All of a sudden, social trust becomes more important. I'm happy to see you guys, but I need to know that you're doing the right things. They're not just going to go, oh, I've got a cold like symptoms. I'm just going to risk this. You know, um, we're going to do communion as, as, as you mentioned there, Lucy with bread. Okay. We've got to do that in the right way now. Cause even in, in the home, we've got to be cleaning and using hot water to wash our dishes, not just giving it a quick, you know, wipe. Um, so what are the things that you can do as a, a church to protect? Um, the third one we realize is to respond. And I don't think we're fully there yet. And in the church, I'm sure there's, there is people listening all over the world. Um, the church in Iran, I know now, is having to respond in you know, quite challenging ways, um, already in an incredibly challenging environment already. Uh, churches in Italy are having to respond. But that's going to become more apparent. For those who are socially isolated in quarantine, suffering from the virus, we need to learn to respond as a church. But also, again, for the economic hit that is going to come. You know, already people are losing their jobs. That's going to get bigger. Um, and then the last one is to lead. So in a sense, what I realized is I've lost a lot of control. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't get, I can't get all my discipleship group leaders in a room and say, hey, guys, this is what I want from you. Already I'm feeling distance from some of my staff. But what that means is I now have to lead not with, in a sense, systematic or authority or positional authority. It's almost a bit like Paul now. When you read some of Paul's letters, I've been reading a few this week and it's almost like, hey guys, please listen to me. You know, I'm seeing this letter across the Roman Empire. Please <laughs> listen to me. I feel a bit like that now. And I think many pastors and leaders do. So in that situation, what counted was Paul's spiritual authority. And I think there's a real thing here that, that people are going to be drawn to that more and more. And in that, you know, I just want to say too, like I, I really feel um, that on the mental health thing, this is going to be a profound mental health challenge for a number of people, particularly pre-existing mental health challenges, the mental health challenges that many people are already feeling. You know, just that multiple people said to me, man, I just feel this ominous sense all the time. How do I deal with that? You know, just going all the time. Like my, my wife said to me like last night, I just been going hard, Mark, you got to make sure even this afternoon, just take some, take an hour or two, just slow yourself down. So there's those challenges, but there's one possible benefit um, so much of my ministry with millennials in the last 10 years has been helping millennials deal with the mental health challenges that comes from a culture of endless pursuit of pleasure, the meaninglessness mm. of hyper consumerism and mm. this secular post-Christian world, which is built on the premise that life's easy. You can have it all. Mm. You can order a shirt from Sweden and it'll be on your door in Melbourne in four days. Like that world is going. And, you know, I believe that meaning is found often in the struggle. And, you know, uh, there's going to be a bunch of people, particularly millennials, who were experiencing a sense of cultural ambient anxiety. And all of a sudden, like, you're going to have a purpose now. Like, you have a cultural role. Malcolm Gladwell talks about during the Blitz in London, um, when it ended, a number of people missed it because there was this sense of community. I went and got a blood test four days ago. <laughs> Normally, you sit there and everyone's just silently in, their, in that little waiting room on their phones. The whole room was talking. Yeah. complete strangers yeah. like chatting about this I'm, I'm going for walks and people are saying hello 
Um, so there's this meaning that's going to be found in this. You know, I, I wouldn't ask for this to happen, but there's yeah. gifts in the struggle that I think can answer some of our mental health problems that are more culturally driven. Yeah. I, I, I would love to just jump in and say a, a similar observation. You know, uh, there are people for sure who are hoarding things here in the U.S., but I've, I've been out to the grocery store half a dozen times in the past week, and, and people are just really much more pleasant <laughs> towards yeah. one another. Uh, and it's, and it's, really, it's really noticeable. Um, it, it's almost as though we've become more gentle in realizing our own vulnerability and acknowledging the vulnerability in the people in our community around us. We're going to have to jump to a quick break here, guys, and then we'll, we'll finish up our conversation shortly. I, I want to keep pursuing that kind of bigger picture thing that, that you brought into play there, though, Mark, about what, what this might mean, where, where we might, as Christians, see God working through this crisis. And, and I, I agree. I mean, I think four months of, you know, basically having to watch Netflix might just get boring, believe it or not. And uh, it, it might kind of force people in some way to ask those bigger questions about what am I here for um, once once the stuff gets taken away that I kind of basically filled my life with uh, up to this point. Um, so yeah, it'd be, be interesting to, to pursue some of those questions just as we start to close out today's program. Uh, we'll be back very shortly uh, with the end of today's show, uh, filmed and recorded live in the Briley household uh, this week because of coronavirus. That's what we're talking about on Unbelievable. We'll be back with my guests, Mark Sayers and AJ Roberts and Lucy Briley very soon. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. Welcome back to the final part of today's edition of the show, uh, podcast and video over on YouTube uh, of this week's edition of Unbelievable, uh, coming from the Briley household because, well, we're not in lockdown, but we are working from home at this point. And um, it's essentially a, an open-ended conversation we've been having today between my guests, AJ Roberts from Reasons to Believe with a background in virology research, been really helpful to hear some of the uh, scientific aspects of this and uh, the clinical stuff behind it. Uh, Mark Sayers, pastor in Australia and a theologian of church and culture has joined us as well. Make sure to check out links to both of these guests. Um, they've got brilliant ministries um, in different parts of the world. Uh, so, so that's all available from the Unbelievable podcast. Uh, you can find it there or over at our website, premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, I've been joined by, by the Reverend Lucy Bryant as well, which has been a first for this show as well, which has been really fun. Um, I mean, I want to get back to those, those kind of questions about what this might mean for the church in the long run and that kind of thing. Uh, but AJ, just as we were in the break there, you were just um, screen sharing. I don't know if this will come up on the, on the, uh, the video recording here, but, but you were sharing a kind of some graphs showing the way that the um, this has been spreading in different parts of the world. So just talk us through this one again quickly. Yeah, so if this is coming through, um, the, the orange line is actually the uh, reported cases from China. And as you can see, that one's sort of flattened out, uh, possibly because it's under control uh, or maybe for reporting reasons. The green line are the number of global cases that have been infected and have recovered. And what I had mentioned earlier in the podcast was this yellow line. This is cases outside of China. And as you can see at the right-hand end, this tail is where we are now. And that's a much steeper curve yeah. than we saw in China at the original outbreak. And so, so what so that's indicating is- what, what we're seeing now happening yes. um, in, in contrast to China in other parts of the world is much more of a kind of an exponential steep curve um, in, in the growth of cases. And, and that obviously is, is worrying because, because that's, that looks very different to what they managed to do as far as we're aware from the data we've been given from China. And that's why, that's why places like the UK and Australia and the US are, are taking the measures that they're taking now. They're countermeasures to flatten that curve, that curve that's very troubling. We don't want to see that curve in any one of our countries and we don't want to see that on a global level either. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, coming back to the kind of the big picture issues Mark, I, 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 I do wonder sometimes whether 
God, sometimes it, God can use things. I don't believe God, if you like, orchestrates terrible events and things like that. But I do believe that God can use things to bring a world back to an, a knowledge of, of who he is. And, and in a sense, there, there's almost a sense where I wonder, could, could, could this be forcing a comfortable Western world, which has for so long assumed, well, we can look after ourselves. We've got technology. We've got medicine. You know, is, is this a way in which we might see people realize, oh, we're mortal after all, and we can't necessarily be our own savior? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think in the last five years, what we've seen is a profound shaking of so many things that we look at in the West as our cultural idols. Um, if you look at Hollywood, um, which in many ways was, you know, driving the culture, it has had this me to absolute humiliation. The Academy Awards is like a group of people punch drunk, wondering what they're going to do now, you know. Um, and, you know, you look at the global financial crisis uh, in 2008, uh, you know, it was this humiliation of Wall Street, um, our political systems mm -hmm. from Brexit to um, all over the world, you know, you've seen this incredible humiliation of establishment politics. Uh, we have a climate change crisis um, that's affecting the world. Um, and I sort of thought, man, I think the world's had all these shocks, you know, and, and then this is just the, you know, piece de resistance on top of all of them, putting pressure on all of those. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I don't, I agree with you. I don't think this God is causing this, you know, I, but I do think, you know, as Roman says that God uses things for good and um, that I believe that I'm, you know, already from, you know, my staff and friends, there are people having spiritual conversations at their workplaces, friends who they've never had with before. Um, already before this, in the last two years, I've had people, and I never thought this would happen. I was a big, like, church has got to go out, and I still believe that. But we had people turning up cold turkey, asking questions, because they were just like, I'm not responding to what the culture is now telling me, um, who had no background in church. Um, so I've seen that as a trend. I know that's happening in cathedrals in Australia, in the UK. People just walking in, hey, like, tell me your story, because I, I need a good story. I just wonder whether this is going to absolutely accelerate that. And, you know, a big thing, you know, my, my last book group here in church was really about what are the prospects of a renewal of the church in the West in this moment? And, you know, my, one of my arguments is that if you look at the history of awakenings, revivals, renewals, they often um, come after cultural crises. Mm -hmm. And, man, if, if what is incredible is we, we've created this system um, which we are now learning this global system, which is not as resilient as we thought. If you've got your insulin uh, production, if the United States has the majority of its insulin production in China, a country which is at economic, moral and narrative warfare, though not kinetic warfare at the moment, and all of a sudden something like this happens, you're not, your system isn't that resilient. But also this, this, this system has created humans that are not that resistant <laughs> in the West. And that resiliency is now going to be tested. And I actually think it's going to be built in people. And I actually think people are going to be forced to have a look at their own fragility, their own mortality. Even if you're a super fit, super healthy 30-year-old, you're going to be thinking of your parents, your loved ones, people in your community, um, the world. I, I just had this moment where um, there was an article uh, written by Matt Stoller, who's an economist. And he said that you have a whole generation of people now who have grown up in an abundance uh, economy who now are going to have to get used to a scarcity economy of shortages. Mm. He said millennials have never seen that. Mm. I went to the supermarket uh, two days ago with my daughter who's 12 and we walked in and there was literally like empty shelves. It was this tension in the air. And I thought that's going to be this memory that my daughter has. She's going to grow up. Like we were wor so worried that this generation was going to grow up super entitled and that was a problem. But I wonder if God's going to use this to actually build resilience in a new generation. Our church now is being globally is being pushed to this axe reboot. It's this crazy moment, this axe reboot. Um, and and just, just finally, like, I just wonder a way forward history, you know, Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And I think it gives us ways forward. I just wonder, I think of the church in the dark ages where so much of the Western network which was the roman empire collapsed and all those roads and supply chains fell over and what happened in ireland on the edge of the world these people went into these little cells these hermits these little communities of small groups of people and it was almost like god allowed things to go fallow for a period but the intensity of their response came out in two ways number one there was what they called um 
I think it was the white martyrs were the ones who um, uh, basically just then went to prayer. Mm. And there's going to be people who are going to be cut off at the moment who are isolated. There's an invitation to pray and worship like never before. There's going to be less distractions. There's going to be people stuck in homes. We're now doing online live streaming prayer. Um, my friends' churches are talking about 24-7 prayer now that millennials are wanting to push into, who were yesterday were like had too many options. Mm. And the second response in, of the church in Ireland was then to send out this other group of martyrs who went out in mission, these little coracle boats across the world who re-evangelize Europe. There's this opportunity now to respond, to have a meaning, that the needs are very primary and practical. So what if this is a reboot that God is doing in his church for actually a global renewal at this moment? Yeah, I, I, we, we can pray, I think, that, that God would use it in that kind of way. Um, I, I, I often feel like it is in a crisis. I don't know about you, Luce, but I, I tend to see people have two kinds of reactions, uh, especially when they're confronted with suffering and evil. And for some people, basically, they, they blame God and they say, that's it, I'm done, I'm out kind of thing. Mm. But actually, a lot of people, I find the opposite. Yeah. It forces it. They they realize God's all they've got. That that they, they don't have the hope they had in something else. Now, there's a huge extra question we're not going to have time to unpack on this one, which maybe I'll do with you another day, AJ. Which is that whole question of why does God allow a world in which viruses and illness and natural evil and so on occur? And I've got I've got lots of people asking those kinds of questions. Um, but maybe that that's one to tackle kind of in its in its own show at some point. Yeah, but, I'd love uh, that. that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be. But I, I don't know. Um, what do you think, Liz? Do you think that some of what Mark's saying could could be the reality that we could see something potentially in the long run really yeah. good come come yeah. out? Of this? I mean, I think one of the the key messages that I've been wanting to to share with the people I minister to, and and indeed everyone I meet, is is you know we are, we are not people of fear. We yes. we will not be overcome w with fear. I mean, it, it's it's there throughout Scripture and. And we just need to, to assert and, and affirm and, and kind of ground ourselves in what we know to be the truth um, of our faith. And then everything else around us will, it will kind of hover in a weird way for a while until we, we understand the, the new reality and, you know, what God's got in store for the future. But, but we ground ourselves in the fact that we're people of faith, not fear. And, and I think actually just in these last few days, if, if there's one message that I've tried to get across, it's, it's, it's been that. And that's kind of, that's kind of enough for now. <laughs> Yeah. Faith, not fear. Yeah, I, I you know, think honest, always... honestly, I think about that quite a bit as well, and it's one of the one of the things that I share when I'm often talking about that bigger picture, you know, about the viruses in general, Justin uh, and Lucy. But it it is this these adversities, these challenges, like this particular coronavirus crisis. It's it, it's an invitation for those of us who know Christ, for mm -hmm. those of us who are secure in in our destiny, uh, to actually act out of moral courage, out of the love of Christ, to bear hope into a very dark situation where other people are struggling. And I think, I think Mark was reflecting that when he said the light was going on uh, in the millennials' eyes as he was sort of unpacking the challenge before them. They were realizing, hey, this is our invitation to act in the name of Christ out of courage because our security is, is our destiny is secure and uh, our motivation is to minister to others in, in the name of Christ for the sake of Christ. I love to quote N.T. Wright, and I think Justin will let me get away with this, um, <laughs> but his, his response to uh, Christian suffering that I heard him share at a conference back in 2000, uh, which stuck with me. I, I played that audio over and over again until I memorized the quote, and I use it in my talk as well. It's, it's the way of Christian witness is not the way of militant zeal, nor the way of quietest withdrawal. It's the way of being in Christ, in the spirit, at the place where the world is in pain, so that the love of God may be brought to bear at that point. It's very important to be in prayer at the place where the world is in pain. It's part of our Christian vocation. And I just think that that's so important to remember individually and to encourage one another with that same, that same idea. Um, I really hope this show has been helpful for, for anyone listening and watching. Um, Unbelievable, as many people know, is normally a kind of Christian, non-Christian dialogue. And But we do sometimes do these kinds of shows where we bring Christians together to dis discuss this. And I felt this was a time for that to happen. Uh, and I hope that the many 
non-Christians listening have also benefited and appreciated from it. Something I never do. Don't, again, this is a show of firsts. It's <laughs> being recorded from home. I've got Lucy on the show. Uh, I've never done this either. I've never asked anyone to pray at the end of a show. But I am going to ask, um, Mark, if you would do the honours for us mm. on this occasion, would, would you say a prayer? Mm. And uh, I will just encourage those who are not Christian listeners to this show uh, to, to bear with us as we do that. And, um, but I, I will ask you to, to close us out with, with a prayer, if you would, Mark. Mm. Yeah, let's pray. Loving God, we realise that at this moment we pray as individuals, but really we pray as your church, your people, um, in the world at this moment. The first prayer I want to pray, Father, is that you will halt this pandemic, the pain, the dislocation, the fear that it's causing across the world. Father, we ask that you'll be with those who are at the front line of this, the healthcare professionals, the doctors, the nurses, those in ER. We pray in your name that you'll be with them as they fight this in the trenches. We pray for the affected those who are suffering those who have lost be with them father comfort them as they mourn as they struggle uh, we pray also for those who at the moment who feel vulnerable who are in isolation who feel disconnected who feel like the world has been upended those facing economic fear uh, who already their businesses seem to be falling over father we just pray you'll be with them at this moment and in the midst of this, may we be those people who are praying at this point of pain. We know, Father, that sometimes we have answers, but we know that in the story that we're walking through in this Lenten period towards uh, the cross at Easter, that the message of Scripture is that you came alongside us in the midst of our human experience, in the midst of our pain. And it's, it's just more profound than ever this Easter. We wait for that third day when you rose again and you were that gardener in John's gospel where you planted new seeds. And we pray, Father, out of this fallow moment where the world seems to be stopping, that actually new seeds of growth and renewal of, of health will spring in the world. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 AJ, Mark, thank you very much for being with thank us. Thank you, Justin. On this, uh, kind of emergency broadcast of us. Yes. Um, it's been really great. I've been so glad. Um, I guess though you guys didn't have much else to do because you're kind of stuck at home as well. Like, like <laughs> us. But um, anyway, um, bless you guys for, for all that you are doing, um, for, for all the helpful advice you're, you're managing to put out there, AJ, and um, just your wisdom as well uh, on the show today, Mark. Mm. Thanks for being uh, we're okay. going to be spending a lot of time together anyway, so yeah. I thought we <laughs> quite like each other. So, this, so far, so good. <laughs> this may not be the, the only unbelievable show featuring Lucy Briley. Um, anyway, um, great to have you all uh, with me, joining me for today's show. Uh, God bless you, and uh, yep, we'll see you later. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.